So hello, everyone. This is Danielle Grant from Leadership Global. Thank you for being with us today. And joining me today is Otti Vogt. Otti's a good friend of Leadership. Otti's a disruptive thought leader with over 20 years of experience in implementing strategic business change in multicultural complex businesses and in crafting human-centric learning organizations. He's passionate about personal and organizational transformation. As Chief Operating Officer of ING's Challenger and Growth Division, he's accountable for ING's Global Digital Transformation Program and continuous optimization of operational service performance for more than 20 million customers worldwide. Previously, Otti was a senior executive in BT's Global Services Division and earlier gained a wide range of experiences consulting, industry, nonprofit, and startups. Otti is an associate of the Globally Responsible Leadership Initiative, known as GRLI, and was recently named Top 20 Global Thought Leader on Agile by Thinkers360. Today, we're speaking about the fifth revolution, a topic that's increasingly important for the health of our organizations. What's the fifth revolution, I can hear you ask? Well, as Otti puts it, after the fourth revolution focused on technology and change, we need a humanistic revolution focused on moral leadership. Perhaps this has been highlighted especially recently as we've seen global cooperation and collaboration come under strain, perhaps more at the political level than in many corporates, as we've seen instances of vaccine nationalism, which contrast with the cross-company initiatives to speed COVID treatments, creation and production of vaccines. And perhaps that fifth revolution can embed and build on those examples. So, Otti, I'd really like to welcome you to the programme today, and we're really interested in uh, having our thought processes stretched even further. What a wonderful introduction, Nadia. Thank you so much, and it's a pleasure to be here indeed. So, Otti, my first question today is that we've started to become familiar with the term the fourth industrial revolution around the information age that we now live in. So what do you mean by the fifth revolution? Thank you for the question. I, um, of course, I'm playing with that notion a little bit. And like you, like you say, we, we have become familiar, I would say, even more with the third revolution. The third revolution was the digital revolutions or the com computerization um, and digitization, which, which has kept us very um, busy and progressed us, uh, so to speak, in the last century. And now the fourth industrial revolution with smart technology and automation and uh, big data and internet of things is again try to, taking us to a new dimension. And I sometimes sense that we need to ensure that with all the smartness that technology brings and enables us, we need to progress in, the, in regards to our own humanity at the same pace to ensure that technology remains an enabler for us rather than us becoming victim of technology. And I think many people are starting to talk about um, a potential for AI, uh, for example, to take the role of classical management, where we would find ourselves in organizations not so much, not so much dominated by our bosses, so to speak, in the worst case, but dominated by algorithms who would then from the center control what every person employee and every employee needs to do. So in terms of my kind of notion or concept proposal of, of a fifth revolution, I'm thinking about three connected things. The first is, I believe, the, the necessity to go back to um, ethics, as you mentioned earlier, to worldviews. Ethics, I think everybody is familiar in terms of it being about what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is bad. But I think ethics even more is about vision and what type of future we want to endorse. And here, I think it's really important that we start to ask ourselves kind of what future do we want? Do we want to continue along the lines of a kind of consumeristic, individualistic, capitalistic society? Or do we need to rethink given the challenges that we find in terms of the um, ecology around us, the, the, ex the externalities that our, our market society, our market capitalism is producing. 
And so that's the first aspect. What, what is truly the purpose? What, why are we here? What do we stand for? The second aspect, I think, is more about um, our organizations and the metaphors we use. Again, very related to this notion of scientific or industrial revolution, we have always treated organizations like machines. We've tried to optimize them and, and treated employees as resources or capital. And I think that um, today is not, from an ethical standpoint, is not right, but also in terms of the complexity and the, the fast changes in the environment is becoming less and less effective. So I think we need to rethink how we see and how we optimize organizations. And lastly, uh, it is about leadership. I think it is about the maturity of our own development and we need to revise how we think about the individual vis-a-vis -vis the collective and we need to think about how we deal with power. And I think that requires, we're here with leadership, that requires vertical leadership development to, to look at how, how we ourselves kind of can become better at um, dealing with uh, not only technology, but also the big questions that we're facing today. So I think those three axes for me are about a revolution where humanistic management stays ahead of technological development in terms of our worldviews and purpose, in terms of how we develop organizations and how we develop ourselves. Yeah, I think the risk otherwise is that we become overwhelmed by the technology and lose the sight of the human beings at the heart of it. And it makes me think of, and I don't know if you've seen some of the uh, the movies, the uh, with the, the little alien inside a great big robotic body. And are we going to be just that little alien inside a robotic body one day, or are we going to retain our humanity? Yeah, and I think um, Steve Jobs once quipped that robots don't have dreams, right? I think hum we as humans need to maintain the dreaming. Right? Otherwise, it's going to become very difficult. So what is it about our world that makes this a new imperative for organizations and for leaders? I mean, I cannot, I was, when I was, I was I'm always saying when I was young, I had all the answers today. I'm, <laughs> I'm old and I've got all the questions. So I, I couldn't possibly speak on behalf of everybody. But what I have personally felt very strongly as an organizational leader is that we kind of, as organizations, we have an accountability which transcends the boundaries of the organization as such. We need to stand up for something that we believe in. And here, to your question, why is there a need for something else? I think, one, um, the, the mental health, I think, especially throughout the pandemic, is, a, is an increasing warning sign that something isn't quite right in terms of how we, how we frame our own purpose. As I, as I mentioned earlier, I think there's a need to rethink. I think people are now starting to understand that just going down this hedonistic treadmill of uh, accumulating social goods or, or material goods and wealth is not going to give them that happiness and that flourishing and, and satisfaction that they desire. So I think there's a, there's a strong need to revise that. And I'm more and more in conversations with people who very strongly feel in the context of the pandemic, this, this trauma that the lack of social belonging and relationships is starting to really become um, very prevalent. And secondly, I think there's something in terms of there's, there's real suffering that we have created through the model that we are sustaining and, and suffering inside the organization. And I think there are some interesting statistics which sustain that more than $7 trillion are wasted every year globally due to employee disengagement. Um, my good friend, Antoinette Weibel of the University of St. Gallen speaks of suffering machines. So the traditional bureaucracies, which take the aliveness out of the, the employee. So I think there's a, there's a need to revise how we can create organizations that offer more opportunities for development and, and um, human interaction community. But there's also the, the, the fact that collectively as businesses, we have created quite dire circumstances at times. There's, there's hunger, there's loneliness, there's burnout, there's the ecological collapse that we are witnessing. So there's a need also in terms of the externalities that we've produced to revise how to go about it. And I think the, um, the, the, um, the third aspect maybe is complexity. 
it is just a fact that in terms of the in increasing change of technology, of data, of knowledge, um, we as organizations cannot just proceed as before. We need to find ways to create organizations, and this is Ashby's laws of um, variety, that are as diverse inside the organization as the diversity is outside the organization. Because otherwise we will not be able to sustain kind of the, our effectiveness uh, in the context of the, the changes that we are facing. And that requires us again to look at how we can bring everybody in our organizations into a dialogue to look at how the organization can progress. I think the times where we could just preach strategy down the hill, so to speak, and have central bureaucracy are, are probably over. And certainly that is my personal experience. So I would say, so one, from a purpose perspective, I, I feel very strongly we need to revise what we stand for. Secondly, in terms of the, the suffering that we are creating, there are better ways to organize ourselves. And, and finally, in terms of complexity, uh, we just have to organize differently. So on the basis of what gets measured gets done, maybe we should be trying to discover a way to create a health and happiness index um, and a metric for us to seek to achieve both as individuals and organizations and our impact on the society that we serve or the community that we serve. Absolutely. And I think so I was um, I had the pleasure to speak to Richard Barrett about a, a week ago about some of the work he is doing on on alternative indicators. But I think there's a lot of uh, knowledge out there by Baron Layard and the work he's, he's done on happiness and then the, the um, human development indicator, which I think is pro proposed by the United Nations. So there are alternative indicators. And like you say, it's time that we use them. GDP was never meant to be our only indicator of progress in society. And I think profit before taxes or share, or share price is an equally bad indicator for success inside an organization. So what are the barriers that you see we need to overcome to make this idea gain traction? That is, again, Daniel, a huge uh, question, I think. Um, I mean, if you look at this across a number of dimensions, then maybe we can, we can discuss a few of those barriers that I see. So the first thing in terms of purpose. So I'm saying we need a purpose that transcends profit and, and even transcends what we have today, like a triple or quadruple bottom line. I think we need to really look at the morality of our organizations in enabling human flourishing. And I think um, what, what, like you suggested already, not having measures for that is a problem. And again, there's also a challenge with what measures would actually work. I find Dave Snowden's endeavor, for example, to look at storytelling in organizations much more than aggregate measures, quite inspiring. And the second aspect is, of course, ownership. Right? Let's not fool ourselves if an organization is dependent on, kind of, um, quoted on the stock market and, and, and has ownership that is kind of uh, proliferated, so to speak, or, or shared, um, and, and requesting financial returns at short term. That is something that we need to look at. Right? So we need to understand how we can work with the um, owners of the capital to provide more, um, more sustainable ways to, to drive organizations, right? So I think, but again, there's interesting developments happening in terms of alternative structures or so B Corps, we know. Uh, there's Graham Boyd, for example, who's exploring, I think he calls it fair shares common. So alternative organizational and legal structures that might be more convenient to enable this new purpose. And then if we look at structure of organizations, I think here again, a structure is very often maintaining power in, in the way that it was originally and, and envisaged in terms of bureaucracy. And I think, again, we need to, we, we need to overcome um, a centralized power model and a decentralized power bureaucracy. And there are many, many interesting developments that are, are happening in terms of um, sociocracy or lacracy in terms of, in, in regards to alternative structures or the work that Haya is doing or um, other um, companies. But I think it is at the, at the base, it's about power and power sharing and information sharing. And that requires an, a mature dialogue inside an organization to, um, to look at that. If we think about organizational processes, I think, 
in order to enable this adaptiveness, agility, and continuous learning, we need to put in place um, liberating structures. So structures that enable people to come together, uh, have dialogue, resolve conflicts, self-manage, and um, doing that at scale is not so easy. So I think here really it is uh, also an, a need to look at new methods beyond agile in terms of how to bring as many people as possible, how to create organizations that can learn. And not only learn in terms of how they achieve certain outcomes, but also how they organize. And that is certainly something that here in ING, we've, we've spent um, a significant amount of time on because it requires also education. Um, another angle, of course, is culture. Uh, and here, I think uh, I'm very grateful to the work of Amy Edmondson and others in terms of psychological safety. Um, creating organizations that are not fear and blame cultures where people take entrepreneurial risk, where people are um, happy to make mistakes. But I think even more so where people collaborate and take accountability for the whole. So I'm looking at organizations like Bootsock here in the Netherlands, where um, there is a very strong underlying, underlying culture in terms of how people take care of each other and, and uh, the norms that go with that. And I think that is really important in these new organizations that are more self-managed. And finally, of course, leadership, as I said earlier. So I think in terms of leadership, what I've experienced is leadership in a self-managing organization becomes a lot more difficult. It's a lot easier to be a central, typical, hierarchical leader and tell people what to do. It's less effective though. And in order to have um, what, what uh, leadership calls transpersonal leadership and leaders who are able to hold the space for others to, to develop and, and take ownership, that is not easy. It's more like an acupuncturist, someone who holds the system and always looks at ways to unblock organizational energy, so to speak. And, and certainly I found that uh, a not easy journey. What brought us here doesn't want to bring us there. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's something that leaders have to get used to themselves as they move from um, being measured on their own results versus how they um, how they inspire and facilitate results by the whole organization or by their teams. And that needs some freedom to operate. So what are the benefits of it? You talked about um, hierarchical leadership not working. So if it's a more difficult path of you's ex you've explained, why should organizations adopt this thinking? What is the benefit to them? What's in it for them, which is the classic question. <laughs> yes, and I think, Daniela, I want to make, as you said, um, for the leaders, how they get measured. I think the other aspect is how we measure ourselves. Because I recall when I was, in terms of how I measured my self-worth, when I was a junior leader, I would lie in bed at night and think about the actions someone had given me and how I was moving ahead in, 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 in completing those. Then a few years later, I would think about the actions I had given myself and where I was on, on completing those. And I think as long as we are measuring ourselves on being clever and smart and perfectionist and so on, we've got a challenge with letting control go. Today, I'm trying to only ask myself two questions when I'm in bed at night. And this is, have I learned something? And have I helped someone else to learn and develop? And that reframes the way that I'm having impact in organization. But as you suggest, it's not so easy. So what are the benefits uh, in embracing this? So again, as I said, one, I feel very strongly, but of course, uh, some people will disagree that this is the wrong question. All right? Uh, well, yes, I think... Um, as Peter Drucker always suggested, the, the, the purpose of a baker is to create nourishing bread. Profit is a, is a byproduct or money is a byproduct, but it has never been the, the real purpose. And I think there is a challenge with the way we frame purpose today. For me, purpose is not so much a new glorified mission statement, but it's about stepping back and saying, what can I, with the resources and capabilities and the people I have, contribute to making this world a better place, including my customers. Right? As someone suggested, I think Colin Meyer at the Davos, the purpose of business is, is to fix the world's problems profitably, but the, the focus is on fixing the world's problems. So I think the first, it should really be a desire of organizations to contribute to making this world a little bit better, including the services we provide for our customers. And I think this is what this new logic allows us to. 
But then secondly, as I said, the benefit is also that as BCG suggested last year, if we want to survive in these new 20s as organization, we have to be able to compete on learning. Right? As we said in Agile always, our intention was to get best at getting better. And I think this is only possible if we are creating an environment, a context where every single person at work can contribute, but also can develop, can grow, can flourish, where, where agency becomes activism. And I think, again, so I don't see at least organizations that are in the middle of these changes that we are living, I don't think they have a choice, also from a commercial economic standpoint. Which organizations or leaders are you aware of that you've noticed are on this path? I'm not enough, let me put it that way, but I'm sure loads that we don't necessarily see. I think in my experience, Someone suggested, and going back to a spiral dynamic color scheme, that uh, we have these uh, teal dots in an orange world. So we have these uh, forward thinking leaders at all places in an organization, but very rarely are they connected and, and able to create movements that really um, move us ahead at scale, so to speak. And um, But that said, I think there are some, some very interesting organizations in their own right out there. I'm a, I'm a big fan of um, Bob Keegan's work on, on deliberately developmental organizations. And one organization that he mentioned was Decurion, an organization in California. And Brian Ungert, uh, its chief purpose officer, is a, is a, is a good friend and colleague. Um, then, of course, organizations like Haya. We're looking at Haya a lot uh, with my friend Emanuele Quintarelli um, on, on how can we leverage micro enterprises, as they call it. Um, then maybe organizations like Bozok in the way that they create um, self-managing teams, uh, for example. But others like Al Gore, W. Al Gore is very interesting. Um, so there, there are quite a few organizations out there. I also invite people to have a look at uh, Gary Hamill's and Michele Zanini's book on humanocracy, which shows quite a few case studies that are quite interesting. But I think what I personally get most inspired by are the new companies. Unfortunately, they're small, so to speak, but um, we had a recent conference where some startups demonstrated that it is absolutely possible to self-manage um, even salary setting and things like that. And, and I think here again, talking about blockers earlier, we really need to look at our HR and finance practices in organizations. Uh, traditional performance management is one of the most problematic anchors of a kind of the vestiges of a of a managerial um, arteriosclerosis, so to speak. And there, we, we need to make sure that we are not creating procedures and processes that signal to people that they are distant or that we do not trust them. Um, so long answer, but I think there are some out there, but I wish it would be more. What, uh, one final point, maybe Bill Anderson, the CEO of uh, one of the divisions in Roche was speaking at a recent conference and, and suggested that he was taking some of this on board. And, I was very happy because it's a very large organization embracing this. Yeah, so what we need to get is, is that level of tipping point where more people begin to see the value and, and the health of the organizations that have adopted this path. And so always you get to the point where there's safety in numbers and you start to get people following the, uh, the, the, the lone lunatics that start out on these paths. Absolutely. I think there is a little bit of rebellion, as you suggest, in this, even if low lunatic, I think, again, we need to be careful we're not falling back into a hero um, yeah. leadership discourse, as, as Simon Weston calls it. I mean, because otherwise, again, it's dependent on one single person. And I think I would almost describe the success of these new leaders in inverted commerce, those that if they went away tomorrow, it would make little visible change because they're creating systems that are self-managed indeed. And I think our vision of leadership is really what we call eco-leadership. So it's a distributed leadership capability. It's not a role because as, as I, I tried to write in a, in a little article, the leadership itself can become quite a, a, a strong force to maintain status quo if we're not carefully examining it all the time. And followers are also sometimes projecting on their leaders out of fear because um, they are not so willing to take over ownership in certain situations. So I think 
again, I think, uh, yes, we need some of those corporate rebels, but we need them to very quickly gather around them kind of the, a, a shared power uh, base to continue. Creating a movement, certainly. So what are your top tips for anyone who's interested in and feels that this way of, of running organizations and contributing to the well-being of the world and the health and happiness of those in their organizations and the communities that they serve, how, how can they get started? What are some of your top tips? I think the, um, the, the few that come to my mind, but the first thing I would say is start small and start somewhere, but do, do start. It's not an easy journey, but it's ultimately a very fulfilling journey in my experience. Um, but also be patient and self-compassionate, right? It, it, it will take time and making, creating sustainable organizations is not as straightforward as creating bureaucracies. But I think a few things come to my mind. Firstly, I think, as we said, revise purpose. So think about, Kind of what is good what what do you stand for as a leader we cannot remain as leaders morally mute if our kind of very existence is at stake i think secondly what i found very very useful is to create spaces for this leadership and and even adult development and what we created is um uh, peer and team coaching and solidarity groups where people could share their challenges in terms of leadership but also in terms of the emotional interaction and, and conflict management and things like that. Because if we create spaces where the leaders are not prevalent, people need to upgrade their agency and ability to work with others. Um, organizational design, I would really, really, really suggest people look at um, not only complexity theory, but also some of the alternative organizational designs like, like sociocracy and start to experiment with that. Give some of your power away and see how it works. Um, and final two points, maybe one is find your rebels. I think as Daniel, as you suggested, where are those rebels in your organization? Embrace them, give them freedom, help them to make a, um, make a difference. Here in ING, we had a movement called the Musketeers, which was 350, 400 people around the world who we endorsed to, for, with, with a, a high, high degree of freedom to just do whatever was required to bring out organizational engagement and aliveness and learning. And um, secondly, we, we talked about this. Look for the blockers, as you suggested, Daniel. Where, where are those blockers in terms of recurring negative patterns of stories that are being told which are not helpful or structures and, and procedures and systems or harder things? Where are the blockers to aliveness? Where are the blockers to trust? Where are the blockers to learning and engagement? And go after them one, one by one and then maybe go... Um, where the least resistance is. So you, you get some successes before you go after the, the real power base. Yeah, that's great, Artie. And uh, certainly we always ask people when we're talking about changing organizations to look for the people that are that are willing and willing to change and help them to influence other people so that the people that are more anxious about change, then feel safer to embrace these new ideas, because we shouldn't underestimate the fact that not all of us are ready to go out and be pioneers, and we have to make others feel psychologically safe, as you quite rightly mentioned, so that they feel that they can embrace their more adventurous side as well. Absolutely, and I think we, we should not forget, as I said at the beginning, I, it all starts with ourselves. In my experience, if, if leaders in an organization are unwilling to go on a personal transformation journey, it's very, very hard to, to pretend and believe that the organization will transform. So I think it starts with ourselves. And I'm, I'm always saying we're not leaders because we, we rule. We're leaders because we truly care. And this psychological safety starts with us not only being empathetic, but truly caring for our people, but also for the wider ecology that is connected to our organization and, and taking ownership for the whole. That's uh, great, Otti. Thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, so that's all for today's episode of Leadership Comes Alive. I'd like to thank Otti Vogt very much for being with us today. And thank you all for listening. I think this has been a really 
uh, fresh ideas to come to you all. And hopefully, if we come to talk about them again, they won't be so fresh. They'll be far more the norm and we'll have happier, healthier organisations that contribute more to the well-being of, of our planet and other human beings. So until next time, this is Danielle Grant from Leadership Global.